Okay. Because I uh, hey, I'll uh, be teaching is, a. Uh, this is Ron K. Armstrong, filmmaker extraordinaire, and um, as you heard a little earlier just now, I'm here with Professor Toriano Berry, uh, filmmaker extraordinaire. Professor, uh, he taught at Howard University. Professor Berry, say hi. Hey, how's everybody? Good, good. You looking good? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's two of us, man. It's two of us. Yeah, that's great, man. So um, Professor Barry and I worked for a long time. We worked on a couple projects. One of the projects we worked on was a feature film I did called Bugged. And I'm glad that he's taking time out. He's been traveling to talk to us about some of the projects he's worked on. And really just to give us his insight um, on the film industry now, uh, Professor Barry has a long, extensive career um, working on various different productions. He is um, an advocate for filmmakers. Um, he has fostered a lot of filmmakers and in in getting their careers out there through film programs and through individuals like myself. So this is really a, a treat to have him here to talk a little about, you know, everything. Um, so the first thing I want to ask you, Professor Barry, and this is... Um, something that not many people may know about, but you actually before, I, I think you actually did one of the first uh, feature film, horror films um, called The Embalmer, is that correct? Uh, yes, but there's no D on it, just Embalmer. Oh, Embalmer. No, but really what I think it was, was I was, I believe I was one of the first, um, you know, African-American uh, filmmakers to actually start working in the genre of uh, like science fiction and horror, which actually started before I did Embalmer. I did a, uh, my UCLA thesis project was a uh, pilot for a, a series called The Black Beyond, which was kind of like a uh, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits type anthology series. And um, I did it because I came up with the idea, you know, because, um, you know, Twilight Zone was very popular, but it was gone. Outer Limits, you know, was popular, but it was gone. And yet in San Diego, while I was in, at UCLA back in the uh, early 80s, um, for Thanksgiving, they would have a, a uh, Twilight Zone marathon, you know, like 24 hours of Twilight Zone. So I'm like, well, you know, it's still popular, but there, is no, there are, were no, no new shows, you know, of that genre. So I said, so it must still be very popular. So I came up with the Black Beyond, again, a black version of, you know, Outer Limits, uh, Twilight Zone. And I did it. And I did the pilot. And, um, you know, I sent it out. And, of course, got, you know, a lot of rejections. But strangely enough, Within the year, um, Spielberg came back with amazing stories. Then they actually brought back um, the, the the Outer Limits. Then they had another store, uh, another uh, anthology series called Monsters that came out, and it was just like a whole trend of you know these same type of shows. You know, came out. Of course, they said no to me, but you know, somebody else got the green light. So who knows yeah. whether I inspired it or not? I don't know. That was just one of many. Forrest Gump moments that I, uh, I I talk about in my career, you know, where something that I did may have sparked, you know, um, another project. That's great. So tell us, tell us, like, what was the story? Like, what was behind that? You know, uh, for the story of Embalmer. Uh, no, it wasn't Embalmer. Uh, the pilot for the Black Beyond. It was actually two segments. The first segment was a short five-minute piece called "In the Hole." And it was about this guy who was in prison. He was imprisoned, and um, he was in prison, uh, and he was talking to his cellmate. He, he had just gotten there. He's talking to his cellmate, and he was in prison for actually killing his his lover, his you know female lover, you know, in a fit of blind passion, you know, because of course you know he thought that she had been untrue to him, which was not the case. So he took her life, and so now he's in prison with you know, this cellmate who basically is in prison for the same crime. Only of course his crime, uh, he took the life of his male lover. And so now they both have to be in this jail cell together. Mm. Now, now um, so you're saying that that was, a, that was like a two part series? What was that? Yeah, yeah, that was the first part. The second part uh, was called, uh, which was the longer part was called, um, dang, what was it called? It's been a while. It's been a while. Ah. Dang. Oh, Deathly Realities. Yes, oh. Deathly Realities. Yes, Deathly Realities. It was basically about this psycho killer um, who um, basically gets taken out by, you know, one of his 
supposed victims, you know. Mm. He's after this, you know, young lady, and she basically turns the tables on him, takes him out, and then he goes into the afterlife. And he finds that all of his previous victims are there waiting for him. Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, so only, uh, you know, find out that, uh, you know, there is life after death and it's eternal. And of course, they start to, you know, attack him and it's going to go on for eternity. So, so where can we see that at? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's on my YouTube channel. But I may have to put it up now that yeah. I've put it out there. I'll put it out there. In fact, I want to say my YouTube channel is Torb1958. T-O-R-B, all lowercase, 1958, no spaces. Torb1958 is in my YouTube channel. And I've got about 40 different pieces on there that I've done over the years. And you know, it's it's funny because after you did that, those two, then right after that came, I believe like Snoop did his little thing and had Tales from the Hood. Oh, yeah. um, whatever it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it, it started yeah, to get a lot, that, a lot of that that came off of, come off that. And even, um, what's your name? Um, dang. I can't ever remember the, the, his name. Uh, Spike Lee's old DP, Ernest Dickerson. Yes. Yeah, he did his little horror movie right around that time, too. You yeah. know, also, my, my, my film came out, uh, Embalmer came out right around the time that, um, um, Blair Witch Project came out. Oh, did it actually? Yeah, wow. Around that time, you know, and I went and saw Blair Witch. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on, how are they? You know, <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it, but but that's that. But um, speaking of Balm, I mean, I eventually did get a uh, distribution, even though I got ripped off. Um, yeah. A company called Spectrum Films picked it up, and um, they went out of business and stiffed me. You know, mm. one of the main reasons I did a horror film, because the thing was, when I was at UCLA in film school, uh, 81 through 85, I was, of course, I started off my first project, my feature, my feature, not feature. Well, it is a feature, but my thesis project was going to be a piece called Light of the World, which dealt with contemporary gospel music. I'm talking about early 80s, you know, Kirk Franklin, Donnie McClurkin, mm -hmm. Pied yeah. Tribbett. I was talking about that kind of gospel music in the early 80s, you know, contemporary gospel music, you know, music that is like, you know, mainstream music only with gospel lyrics, you know, to bring in a whole different audience, you know, that would not be interested in the strict, you know, traditional kind of gospel. Anyway, um, I went into one day of production on my uh, thesis project. My main source of finances did not come through. I knew I could not continue and I had to pull the plug. So I pulled the plug after one day of production cried for a week because that was some painful stuff um and then you know i started realizing that um you know i wanted to do work but i didn't have the money you know to work in film and so somebody i can't remember was was one of the students at, at, at ucla said well you know you can work in video you can work in video you know for a fraction of the cost so that's when i started going towards video taking some more video classes or learn video and i started doing my work in video and then i found it was Amazing because people would say, you know, oh, it's great. Oh, it's phenomenal. Oh, it's wonderful. It's great. It should be on TV. But it's video. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and it just totally, you know, and it's like, wait a minute, but if I could do this with no money on video, what do you think I could do with some money and some film? Yeah. Because at the time, your know, video just was, of course, it's standard. But back then, I kept, kept hearing it. So I had done all this, you know, good work, you know, in my opinion, uh, in video, couldn't get any place with it so my decision was to i said i need to make a feature i have to make a feature and i have to go back to film and so the other thing was why just make a film um when you know i'd have no distributional outlet for it possibly but i read some place where they said there has not been a horror film ever made that has lost money every horror film ever made has made a profit okay because there's just this this die hard audience out there so uh, that's why i came up with embalmer um Originally, the title of it was going to be The House Where Nobody Lived, because it was basically off, you know, one of those concepts about, you know, everybody has a, in the neighborhood, there's this old house, this old creepy house where there's, you know, the monster or the crazy person that lives in this house and don't play by this house or, you know, they'll get you. And so it started off as The House Where Nobody Lived. And then when I came up with The Undertaker, Zach character who was this mortician who slaughtered his family with a scalpel. And then he regretted it. So he uh, started seeking fresh brain, blood, and body fluids to bring his family back to life. And in working on the script, it's like that character became a lot more important than the house. So <laughs> I took it from, you know, the house where nobody lived to, to embalmer. He's kind of like a and, Michael Myers in a way. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of. 
And, uh, you know, I did. I got it done. Of course, you know, I used a, a lot of the, the, the cast. Half of the cast were Howard students. Um, you know, the crew, my crew, you know, were a bunch of my, you know, favorite students. I wouldn't say favorite students, maybe best students, because now nah, maybe they're my favorite, my best favorite <laughs> students, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we got it done. And so again, you know, when I did, uh, you know, get it distributed against Spectrum Films and, um, what happened was, you know, a year they said, oh yeah, well, you know, cause I got a nice deal. It was like, you know, 50% net, no gross, no net. Yeah. 50% net. Right. That's now, really good. Wow. I, but they <laughs> knew, okay, they knew I was gonna see any of that money. They knew it. That's what I said. Fifty percent net. All right, that's wonderful, phenomenal. Anyway, so you know, they gave me the date when you know they'll have the first. You know, anyway, the date came and went. Came and went. I was calling. I was calling. Oh, we'll have them get back to you. We'll have them get back to you. Then finally, I um actually had because I had actually um ended up filing bankruptcy somewhat behind the film, because I actually put about twenty five, thirty thousand dollars into the film. Wow. And then there were some other things that I'd done and I ended up filing bankruptcy, which was the most phenomenal thing I had ever done in my life. Really? Really? <laughs> I wish I had done it six because before I got started, I said, no, 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 I can pull out of it. And I got to, you know, do an extra job and I started paying and paying off, paying off, paying off. And then I just, you know, I couldn't do it anymore. And you know, I did the fresh start. I think it was chapter I can't remember chapter seven or chapter 11, one of those chapters or whatever, the fresh start loan. And it just all, you know, went away. It all wow. went away. But anyway, um, I had my, my bankruptcy attorney contact, you know, Spectrum Films, you know, and they said, oh, well, you know, and so they finally sent me the, uh, you know, the statement. According to the statement, the film had grossed about, I think it was $107,000. Mm. Uh, yeah, I only, you know, put about 25, 30 into it, you know, and they mm. gross a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Now, hold on one second. What, like, how, how long was that? Was that after a year? Like, you know? That was a year, a little over a year. Yeah, yeah. it was a little over a year. And of course, you know, they had home video, they had the home video rights um, in distribution or, or theatrical, but of course they didn't go theatrical, but they had the home video um, and the, the, the theatrical rights. Anyway, and then of course they had this big long list of um, costs. I Itemized list, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've seen one, okay. 98% of that list was probably bogus bullshit. Yeah. But, oh, I'm sorry, can we use bullshit? Yeah, um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, all right, anyway, and so my little 50%, it was like 30 something, you know, um, thousand was uh, what was left. You know, I was supposed to get like 12,000, no, $13,800 was supposed to be my, you know, my, my check. Anyway, some told me to, you know, have my attorney call him, tell him, you know, on such and such a date, you know, I will be, you know, in Mesa, Arizona, have my goddamn check ready. All right. But something weird happened. Um, I had just got saved. You know, I just got saved. <laughs> going through this, this, uh, this religious quest, you know. So uh, instead of doing that, so I said, oh, just put it in the hands of the Lord, put it in the hands of the Lord. So I said, okay, Jesus, Lord, it's in your hands. Well, it's still in his hands because I never <laughs> got it. Anyway, so, you know, I started calling. You know, they said, oh, well, we'll send you a check in you know, two weeks. Two weeks came. Four weeks came. And I started calling. They're not available. Not available. Finally, I called one time and said, the number you have reached is not in service. You know, so they basically, you know, pulled their wow. scam, closed Spectrum Films down. And from the research I did, they started another company called Latter Day Films. Uh, latter day films and i guess you know start all over they went and ripped off some other folks. you know it's kind of common though that that these companies do that you know, no, I know. <laughs> that's something that was so frustrating to me because you know a couple of the 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 um, entertainment attorneys i knew out in la some of the producers i knew out in la and some other places that i would talk to oh yeah yeah they, yeah that happens that happens move on well, well we can probably get your 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 masters back but your money's gone just forget about that yeah just you know everybody was so freaking nonchalant yeah. About, oh, yeah, that happens. That happens. Move on. Forget it. I'm like, let me owe you. <laughs> yeah, you like it, right? <laughs> anyway, but but that was on me. Like I said I should have, you know, been on the airplane and done a tap dance on their desk if they didn't have my check, mm. you know, but I didn't. So there's that. But yeah. that said, you know, like I said, they said there hadn't been a horror film made that hadn't made a profit. 
That's uh, and it made a profit. I just didn't see any. Of it. It. Tell us. I'm, I'm glad you told us that story because we have a lot of filmmakers who watch and want to know, like, in going for a distribution deal, what should they look out for? I, I'm not the one. I'm not the one. All I can say is have a good attorney to go over the contract and, and do that. I'm not. Don't ask me. Okay. Okay. I speak when I should have zag. So don't take my advice. Don't take my advice for it. Um, but definitely, you know, I mean, make sure you got a good attorney, have an attorney, you know, go over, you know, the, the, the contract, you know, and then of course hope that, and then pray that the people are reputable. Now that said, I will admit I did get $5,000, um, from the cable because another company actually picked up the cable rights. Oh, oh. See, I wouldn't even think about that this. That's different it. now. Oh, you, yeah, you, yeah, you broke, yeah. So actually, you actually broke up your rights then. That was good. Yeah, five, yeah, there was a split. Again, Spectrum had theatrical and home video. Oh. And then this other company had the um, cable rights. And I did get five grand from that. So, you know, so still that, underwater. But. That's a lesson to learn. Like, make sure you hold on as, as much territory as you can, you know? Well, I mean, again, only if, uh, you know, if whoever's got the contract is going to live up to it. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, yeah. you've worked on a lot of films, right? Can you tell me what is it? What is the difference? What is it like working on a horror film compared to like a drama? You know, is there a big stark difference? No, no. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think production is kind of, you know, production. Of course, you know, horror films, of course, a lot of times, you know, depending on if it's a, 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 a high, um, What's it called? Um, makeup and stuff. A lot of times you have makeup or special effects. If it has a big special effects budget, you know, yeah, that that can be a lot different, you know, mm -hmm. because you're dealing with the special effects. A lot of times that takes longer. It's a whole different kind of a concept that you have to go into shooting and setting up, you know, the scenes and everything. Whereas, you know, drama, so, you know, it's just pretty much, you know, just set up the actors, block them out, you know, make sure they look good and, you know, get your coverage and, you know, and keep moving. Mm. Um, but pretty much it's just having the vision, as in my opinion, just having the vision in your head, being able to see it in your head, you know, before you actually, you know, put everything or start making sure that you get everything that you need, you know, on tape or on film or whatever it is, the, the format that, that you're using. Yeah. What's your forte? Because I know you're you're a good DP, you're a good writer, you are, um, you know, like you do everything. You wear many hats. So what, what, what do you That's think? By Plan that was by choice. That was by plan. <laughs> yeah, uh, forte. I really wouldn't. Uh, what they say, jack of our trades and and master, master of none. none. Yeah. I won't say master of none because I'm I'm pretty mastery in in a couple mm -hmm. areas. But when I was at UCLA, you know, one of my main things. I, I initially went to UCLA Film School. I said got there in '81 um, after I graduated from uh, Arizona State with a BA in art and photography, and I just wanted to be a cinematographer. I didn't want the headaches and hassles of producing, directing, and all of that. I just wanted to shoot beautiful images that would make people jump out the seats, run up, and lick the screen. You know, that's what I wanted to do initially. Well, once I got to, you know, UCLA, I realized that, you know, why should I or would I be one of the best, you know, cinematographers out there? Again, I'm talking about 81. This is pre-Spike Lee, pre-Townshend, pre, you know, pre- There were no black people out there making movies. This was about four or five years after, you know, the black exploitation era, they pulled the plug on that. So, you know, my prospects look rather bleak from my perspective. So I said, why be one of the best cinematographers out there when nobody's gonna, you know, gonna hire me. Yeah. And so um, I decided that I wanted to know more about producing, directing, and being able to, you know, provide work for myself. You know, so I basically, you know, started learning all aspects from lighting, you know, to camera and sound and and um, directing, producing everything. And I just did what I did. In fact, UCLA uh, graduate program was a two year program. The film program was two year program. You needed 72 units to graduate. I graduated in four years with 140 <laughs> units. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, because after the first two years, I just it's like I hadn't learned enough. I hadn't learned enough. I wasn't ready to go. So I went on and did the third year. And then strangely enough, the fourth year, I mean, the faculty must have got together and said, wait a minute, what the hell is he still doing here? <laughs> just changed. I mean, it was just 
for faculty and professors at it, it, it just it just got ugly. I said, okay, it's time to go. <laughs> you know, but I, I took those extra two years. Like I said I was able to learn, you know, so much more. Every weekend, I was crewing on somebody else's project. Mm. You know, in fact, that's what I would tell all my students constantly. You know, at, at Howard, it's like you know, you will learn more on one day of an actual film shoot than you will learn the entire semester sitting in a class. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I would motivate them all. You know, go find out, especially the grad students, the grad projects. You know, when you're in the tech center and you see somebody's checking out equipment, they're getting ready to go on a shoot. What if you're not doing something that we can ask them? Do you need crew? Yes, you we, you always need crew. You always mm -hmm. need crew, and you can yeah. get so much experience and so much exposure and learn so much. You know, plus like I tell them too, it's like you know, you can also you be you can watch. You know, you can see how they run their set. You know, you can see what they do good, take notes and emulate it. You can see what they do bad, you know, and make sure you stay away from it. And then, of course, when, you know, it's your project, you know, and your name and your reputation is online, of course, you can take that knowledge and that information, that experience, you know, to make yourself look good. Let me take a step back for a moment because I'd like to ask you this. Maybe you can give us some insight. If I were a student looking for a film school, what, what should I be looking at? Like, what is it a film school that has good professors or good equipment? What's the thing I should be looking at? YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear to God, I swear to God, I, I say it jokingly, okay? Trouble is YouTube doesn't give you the piece of paper, okay? It doesn't give you the, the degree, okay? Degrees are important, degrees are crucial. If you have that degree, it means something to a lot of people. You know, if you have that degree, wherever you go, wherever you land, well, maybe not in production, because production is kind of, you know, you pay as you go. But generally in jobs, especially if you're going to teach, if you're going to work in some kind of a, a corporation or company, depending on the degree you have, there's automatically, you know, a higher level set on your pay scale. You know, if you have a BA degree, you know, you get here. If you got a master's degree, the pay scale is here. If you got a PhD, it's here. You know what I mean? So it's crucial. So the piece of paper is important. But mm -hmm. when it comes to just learning, if you if you just want to learn what to do, I swear to God, YouTube has some of the most phenomenal how-to videos that these people get together and put together I I, I and agree. basically break the basics down, you know, that than I've ever seen. And you I know? also, um, I think like, uh, you know, what I paid attention to was like the Blu-ray, the special features and things like that, where they take you yeah. right behind the scenes and really get in depth for two hours about how they made the film, you know? Yeah. yeah, but all, all of that helps. All of that helps. Uh, the other thing, like you talk about as far as film schools, I mean, it's, it, it's different for everybody, you know? I mean, a lot of it might be just, okay, you know, not only just what kind of equipment do they have, what's the faculty, but also some of it may be, you know, the, the location. You know, is there a film school in some place where you have family, you know, or friends that you have a support system? You know, or are you just packing up, going someplace, and you don't know anybody? Because it's always good, I would think, you know, to actually go somewhere where you have a support system behind you. That's like, you know, if, if things get tight and you're a bit hungry, you got an aunt or an uncle or a cousin, you can go over and, you know, and get something to eat. You know, something happens and somebody got to come get you. You may want to be close to home. So if something happens, you know, family, they can come get you. But if you find yourself, you know, out there on a limb in the boondock someplace, you know, that can that can be rough. Wow. So, um, you know, I can't say, you know, what to look for other than, you know, just do your research, do your research and, uh, you know, decide where you think you might like to go, see who's going to admit you. Because, you know, I got, I got rejected from UCLA initially. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I got, I got a rejection letter, which hurt because UCLA, that was the only school, you know, I submitted to because I was like, okay, this is my destiny. And um, actually, yeah, I might as well tell that story. Um, so, you know, I got rejected. I got my rejection letter. I was crushed. You know, I was crushed. So then it's like, okay, you know, so what the hell am I going to do? So I was back in uh, at home in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was raised, and I was working with my dad. My dad had a, a, a you know, janitorial service. So I was just working with him, trying to figure out, okay, what's the next step? And so I was on a job one day, and I came home, and my little sister said, no, did dad tell you? You know, said, tell me what? Say, UCLA called. You got in. I said, no, dad didn't tell me nothing about it. So then when dad came, I said, dad, what's this about UCLA? Oh, yeah, yeah, UCLA, uh, uh, tish me, tish me. I said, to show me? I said, to show me Gabriel? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. He called. He said, you got into film school. You need to call him, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I, I called to show me. No, actually, I didn't call to show me. I just got the letter, I think, the next day or two uh, saying I, I had been admitted. So I just showed up, you know, and everything was great. Now, that said, what happened was maybe my second year, 
I think it was probably my second, maybe third year um, that I was there. To show me Gabriel, for anyone you know, who probably don't know, he was actually one of the faculty you know, at Howard. Great guy, great guy. And um, I was talking to him one day, and he said what happened was there was some guy, some white guy, that wanted to, uh, you know, that they had rejected, whose uncle was some big mucky muck in Hollywood or something. So they came to him wanting his vote for, you know, this guy to get him into the school. So he told him, well, I'll go for your guy if you go for my guy. Oh. And so that's how I got into, uh, you know, UCLA film school. So, I mean, politics and, you know, and contacts and connections, you know, knowing good I'm people in bad places. That's how the world works. People don't understand, yeah. even with film festivals. But um, let's that's talk about it. That's it. A couple of times, you know, I said, damn, if I had gotten to film school, maybe I'd be, you know, millionaire real estate broker by now, <laughs> brain surgeon or something else. Because yeah. uh, it's been painful, okay? I will say this this film career has, has been yeah. painful on a time or two. Yeah, on that note, let me ask you this. Like, so do you like you do you think your life really could have been different? Could you could you have had the house, the picket fence, the dog and the wife, all of that if you weren't a filmmaker? Or would you think your life would pretty much be the same? Like I might, I could have had all of that stuff as a filmmaker, you know? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but it's a, that, you know, that 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 the what if, you know, sometimes I get that. I call it the the attack of the what ifs, you know. What if this would happen? What if that would have happened? What if I'd have done this? What you know? And they just make you crazy because you never know, you know, you know, no, you never know. Now, as a filmmaker, I mean, there are some things that could have happened, you know, earlier, you know, in my career that could have set me off in a whole different tangent, you know, because because initially, well, I, I kind of went back for initially. One, at one point, I said, no, I'm going to stay independent. You know, I'm going to stay independent. Again, I'm talking about, you know, before Spike and all this, there were no black folks, you know, making movies, okay? Yeah. So I was going to stay independent. I said, no, how am I going to let, you know, like have them or Hollywood let me do, you know, what I want to do when there's no one else that looks like me doing it? You know, that was a frustration. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's something else, that, you know, because some of the, the, the white, you know, um, my white colleagues at UCLA and film school, you know, they go, oh, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do now? Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, you know, and it's like, it's like all they saw was blue skies and, you know, and, 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 and open fields. You know, that's all they saw. While I was seeing all these, you know, chains and shackles and hurdles and blockages and everything, you know, before me. You know, but they, oh, what am I going to do next? Why do you want to be a filmmaker? Oh, I just thought it'd be something fun to do. You know, and it, they, they just had no concept of something is going to block me. Something's going to keep me from it. Something, if someone is not going to allow me to do something, mm. you know, mm. which I also always found, found very, very frustrating. Um, but again, you know, some things could have happened, you know, earlier in my career, you know, to, to make, you know, the connection with Hollywood, you know, but it didn't. You know, because it's like I said, initially I wanted to say independent. Then I realized that the independent field was not providing, you know, the finances and resources, you know, that, you know, I needed. So I tried to make some inroads into Hollywood, you know, contacting some of the people that you know, I know in the industry. In fact, one, one, one um, instance I, 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 I'll go into is um, in 1984, I believe it was, 84, I went up to the uh, Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame in Oakland, uh, California. Cause they were big back then, Black Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. Uh, they had a whole weekend, you know, screenings and workshops and panels. And, um, ah, what was his name? This TV director, Stan Lathan. Stan oh, Lathan yes. Was, yes. Was, was on one of the panels, you know. And so I asked, I said, okay, I said, what advice, you know, would you have for, you know, a young aspiring, you know, filmmaker, you know, who, you know, is just coming out of school? He said, stay away from L.A. and New York. You know, <laughs> he said, because there are, you know, two jobs and 2,000 people in those markets, you know, applying for those jobs. He said there are hundreds of smaller markets throughout the country and around the world that you can go, you can get some experience, you know, make some money, build up a name and, and a reputation, and they come back to these larger markets, you know, from a position of power, which made a whole lot of sense to me. You know, so that's actually what I did. So when I graduated from UCLA, you know, I, you know, ended up going to Philadelphia initially, you know, but I didn't have the intent of staying in LA because I figured I'd work that. Now that said, also um, something that ended up being somewhat disappointing for me was that uh, I had taken a picture of him uh, and his wife, um, and it was one of uh, that was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a 
It's in my book, Historical Dictionary of African American Cinema. Oh, anyway, I took awesome. the picture. I took the picture, and uh, he said, well, "I want a copy." I said, "Well, let me know where to send it." You know, so he pulled out a picture in the paper, and he uh, wrote down, you know, his address, phone number, and all that. And so, um, you know, when I got it, you know, I printed up a couple of copies, and um, oh, here it is. I printed up a couple of copies. Anybody see it? Anyway, yeah, it was a beautiful shot. Nice shot. And I, you know, I sent it to him. And then from then I would um, call him and invite him to various screenings, you know, the different screenings that I would have, you know, at UCLA, because every semester I'd set up, you know, with the black filmmakers, we screen our work. But I would generally call and leave a message, leave a message, leave a message. So one time, you know, I called and he happened to pick up. So I said, yeah, you know, this is Toriano Berry, you know, just call and let you know about you know, another screening that we're having, you know, UCLA, blah, 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 blah. You know, he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, he's like, okay, I'll try to make it. And then I said, okay, well, thanks, I'll look forward to seeing you there. And then before he hung up, he said, he said, can I ask you something? I said, yeah, what? He said, how did you get my number? Whoa. And he, and he oh, I mean, it was, it was, it was, Whoa. like, what the f you doing calling fucking shit? And I said, you gave it to me. He's like, oh, oh, ha, 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 yeah, okay, 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 I'll try to make it, I'll try to make it, you know? Anyway, I'm sorry. I ain't begging nobody for nothing. So, you know, I, I, ain't called him since. I ain't called him since. Now that said, you know, that said, did he know that I was the same one that sent the picture? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, you know. But if I had been a little more, I don't know, resolute and kept calling him, you know, maybe, you know, I'd have gotten the screen. In fact, um, a few years ago, I was at this, uh, the S.E. Manley Film Festival out in L.A., and uh, Gina Prince Bythewood mm -hmm. uh, was there, and she was talking. She said how she had met, and she was she shadowed him, you know, on it, and she gave him big credit for you know helping her to you know. And I'm like, well, why couldn't that be my story? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but again, you know, maybe because you know I didn't keep calling, and maybe I should have called, you know, even after that. But again, at the time, I'm I'm like, well, not even at the time still. I just have a hard time feeling and acting like I'm begging anybody for anything. Yeah, I, I understand how that feels. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. tough. It's yeah. tough. Yeah. So, so again, that's say, you know, if, you know, I had not had the ego or whatever it was, I don't know what it was that said I ain't making that phone call again, you know, maybe, you know, things might have been different. Another time, um, Topper Carew. Right, you know Topper Carew? Yeah, yeah. Behind, um... The, what's the TV? The sitcom with Lawrence Martin. Martin Lawrence. Huh? Martin Lawrence? Martin, yeah, Martin. Right, Martin. Yeah. Martin. Okay, well, see, he at one time, I was talking to him about managing me as a uh, as a director. You know, now this was before uh, Martin came in. In fact, they were just working on getting Martin together mm -hmm. at that time, you know? And so I went to meet with them, you know, he's like, oh, well, we'll get you an, an agent or, or a publicist and we'll do this. And I'm going to be doing, working on this project and that project. And I'll bring you, I mean, he done, everything I needed to hear, he was telling me I needed, you know, this, I said, this is great, you know. And then I got the contract. Okay. The contract was 15 pages of what they got, when they got it, how much they got it. If they flew on my, you know, county, it was going to my county, they fly first class and did da, 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 da. I mean, all of this, 15 pages of what they got, when they got it. The only thing it said about me was one little paragraph talk about they will, you know, um, do my image, my image, and my, which sounded more like a, an actor or something, you know, something mm -hmm. I didn't even need. Okay, that was the only thing on paper that it said they would do for me. Well, somewhere I read, if it ain't on the paper, it ain't worth the paper it's not written on, right? Right, yep. Anyway, so I called and I actually talked to his wife. I can't remember his wife's name at the time, but she actually supposedly ran his management company, okay? I'm like, well, Topper said you could da da da. Well, we can't promise that. Topper said he was gonna work with him. Well, by law, we can't do that. Topper said, you know, everything he said he would do for me or he could do for me, she said they can't do it. Wow. They can't do it. You know, and so again, if it's not on paper, you know, and then I'd ask, I talk to people, you know, I say, hey, so, well, no, Topper Crew, <laughs> Topper, uh, well, don't bend over, make sure you got a good attorney. <laughs> That's all I had. So, you know, I didn't have an attorney, it wasn't on paper, you know, so I let that go. And that was right when I got the, uh, the, 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 the teaching position at Howard. I had just got the teaching position at Howard. You know, I never wanted to teach, okay? I never wanted to teach. That was not my plan, was not my goal. I just gra uh, graduated. I just, you know, retired after 26 years, you know, teaching film at Howard. But I never wanted to teach. 
Now that said, I was in my first year teaching in Howard, you know, when I was working on this, uh, you know, this, this um, directing, you know, contract with, with Topper. Now I could have easily, you know, just, okay, thank you, Howard, and went on into this directing contract. Um, but again, it just, it wasn't on paper and Topper did not have the reputation for me to take that chance, you know, so yeah. I stayed. But if I had taken it, you know, maybe, you know, it would be different. In fact, Talking Dirty After Dark, he did Talking Dirty After Dark shortly after that. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and which, well, anybody who remembers it, you know. But, you know, I always wondered, you know, would that have been my film? You know, would I have possibly directed, you know, Talking Dirty After Dark? Maybe, you know, if I had signed on to him. I'd have made some casting, different casting choices for sure, you know. But anyway, that said, that was another possible that thing that might have, you know, linked into something you know, that, that didn't, didn't go. So you know, I've, I've had opportunities. Oh, another time. Really good thing. Even though, strangely enough, um, years later, um, we kind of came back together. But I think, in fact, this might have been the same Black uh, Filmmakers Hall of Fame um, event again in 84, or it might've been another, because I had actually was going from like 81 all the way through 85, I kind of went up there. But anyway, um, I was in the hotel room with Ivan Dixon, Ivan Dixon and his wife. You know who I, Ivan Dixon no, is? No, I'm not familiar with him. Okay, um, Hogan's Heroes. Yeah. Kinchlow, the black guy on Hogan's Heroes. Oh, okay. okay. Nothing but a man. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back in the good old days, it was like Sidney Poitier, and then it was Ivan Dixon. You know, he's like probably, you know, number two, but anyway. I was, uh, you know, up in his hotel room with him and we was talking and I mean, we, I wish I had that conversation on tape. I wish it was like this. All right. Cause we figured it out. We knew we had figured out what needed to happen in Hollywood, how it needed to happen, when it needed to happen. And we had just solved every problem black <laughs> ever had in Hollywood. Okay. Anyway. So at the end of the conversation, everything, you know, it's like, I was like, um, all right. So, uh, man, what was the question? I kind of asked the question like, well, you know, because I think at the time he was directing Hawaii Five O in in Hawaii because he lived in Hawaii, you know, and so I asked him somehow. I can't remember what the exact phrase was. Somehow, you know, well, no, hey, can I? You think I can, you know, come? You know, he looked at me. He reached out his hand. He shook my hand. He said, "Well, you do what you do, and I'll do what I do. Good luck, brother." <laughs> what is this? What is and, it again, and again, again, whether it was pride or what, I'm not gonna say what me by me, but you know, can can I, you know, shadow you at some time? You know, I mean, I'll pay my own way to Hollywood. Can I just come on the set while you're doing, you know, yeah. Magnum PI? I mean, I can, you know, but again, I couldn't do that. I just sh shut down, you know. And that was was kind of another one of those crushing. It's like, oh, you just reach, you're reaching for the brass ring, and then it just gets snatched from you. Yeah. Now that's it. I mean, he's a great guy, and I love his family. I'm good friends with uh, with his daughter Noma. And years later, uh, they were Noma was actually doing a uh, a documentary on this boarding school that he went to, and uh, they actually contacted me to finish editing. I actually shot some additional interviews and finished editing, you know, and it mm -hmm. came out in quite nice, you know. So I mean, you know, it was it ended up being pretty good, you know. I got a chance to, you know, um, you know, connect and all of that. But again, that's just another one of those times that it could have turned into something, you know, could have went somewhere, but but it didn't. Yeah. Well, you know what? What I want to talk about now is like where you're at now, because you've gone from all of that to doing a sitcom called Living Me Life, right? Yes, um, Living My Life. That's that's Belize's first sitcom, right? First episodic sitcom. So actually, I've made um, history twice in Belize. First was uh, No Matter What. Uh, no Matter What was the first dramatic series uh, of Belize, which was um, I was actually one of the co-creators and director. And between 2005 and 2010, we actually did four seasons of No Matter What. And that was, uh, an, hour, and that was an hour each episode, right? Huh? That was an hour each episode, right? Uh, it kind of varied. It, it varied. It varied. Oh. Um, the season one was a one hour pilot followed by four half hour episodes. I think season two was like eight half hour episodes. Season three, I think it was like four hour episodes and four half hour episodes. It kind of, you know, kind of depending on what the scripts and what the budget and everything you know, came about. But um, it was it was it was phenomenal in Belize. 
I mean, I would say it was the scandal of Belize, okay? Yeah. I mean, if if Belize had the gross national product of the United States, as popular as that film was, we'd all be rich. Mm -hmm. But Belize only had like 250,000, you know, population, so it's just real small, can't, doesn't generate, you know, that kind, of, that kind of revenue. But it was very, very, very popular in Belize. And, uh, you know, recently, like I said, I've worked with the same producer, uh, Denver Fairweather of 13 Productions. He has a production company down there and um, he's a producer and we did three episodes of Living My Life which will be the first episodic sitcom of Belize and it just premiered uh, last Sunday in Belize and of course this Sunday the episode two will, will premiere. We were supposed to do between um, six and ten episodes uh, but it just just wasn't just just didn't work out like that. Just now, are you, like I, I, I think it's being written by Ken Vasquez, but are you writing, co-writing, or like? Well, um, Kim and I uh, have had our clashes, I guess you could say. Um, I actually wrote several scripts myself. Oh, I wrote okay. several scripts myself. One of them was uh, called No Matter Who, which I actually, <laughs> I actually wrote in No Matter What. Uh, Tyrone, one of the characters from Living the Life, yeah. Uh, he's a big no matter what fan and he falls asleep one night while watching a rerun marathon of no matter what and he dreams that he is randy diego from no matter what <laughs> and so he actually goes through um experiencing or interacting with several of the characters from no matter what in that episode and then of course in the end he wakes up you know he mm. wakes up and, and it was all a dream and everything um then i wrote, wrote a couple other uh episodes but um one issue that I had um, was the pilot episode. The pilot episode really, you know, I think the story was good, the characters were good, you know, but it just really wasn't funny. It wasn't funny, you know? So I spent a lot of time, I spent about two weeks. I mean, I ran in and punched up a bunch of jokes and, you know, and put a lot of time, work, effort, and energy. And anybody who's written a script or spruced up a script or whatever you want, dealt with a script, you, you know how much time, effort, and energy can go into it. Well, I put a lot of time, effort, and energy into it. Now, the first um, uh, first audition we had, I mean, wasn't nobody even laughing. And the scenes we did, there was not one laugh, one chuckle, no one ha-ha, he-he, no, nothing, no, nothing. And then, um, like I said, a couple weeks later, we had callbacks and a second audition. And we used the scenes, same scenes, but I had scrunched them up, okay? People was cracking up, you know? People, <laughs> I, just, I mean, it was fun. It was funny as shit, I gotta admit. Anyway, um, I made the mistake, and I, I will say it was a mistake. I probably should have checked with her first. Way. But, you know, before I submitted the final script, I gave myself, you know, a, a co-writer's credit on it, okay? Because, look, at, I put some time, effort, and energy in it. It wasn't like I'm trying to take anything from her. It's like, they, oh, Kim, oh, she's such a funny writer. No, she's not. That was me. Mm. I just wanted credit for what I did. Anyway, she did not like that at all. I understand it. And uh, I backed off, you know, and a lot of the bigger stuff, uh, she actually ended up taking out, which oh, was cool wow. because I actually used it in my own scripts. When I wrote my own scripts, I just threw it back in. And in fact, before we actually went into production of the pilot, we had a read through. And the cast was, oh, what happened to the other script? <laughs> 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 what happened to the other script, you know? So that's, that's, how, that's, how, that's how, how that worked. Now, nah, but, uh, you know, Kim and I, when we kind of clashed a lot of times on No Matter What, she was also one of the, the writers on No Matter What. I mean, she's a good writer. You know, she's a good writer. You know, again, with kind of dramatic and themes. But another thing, too, uh, I was constantly um, trying to say, okay, now, Belize is a great place, a great country, a lot of pride. And, of course, these Belizeans say, hey, this is a Belizean story, a Belizean work. They want to be, you know, Belizean. And of course, they speak Creole, you know, which is kind of like a, you know, broken kind of English, different kind of English. You know, they get pissed if you call it patois, you know, like oh. they got, <laughs> you got to fight your way out the room, you call it patois. But anyway, you know, they call it Creole, you know. But the thing is, you know, in fact, when I first went down there, first first day I was on the set. Now, I had read the script, okay, I knew what the script was. And I also, I, I'm, I'm camera, you know, I'm director, I'm camera, I light, you know, I do it to sound. I mean, it's like me and probably one or two, you know, crew people and the cast. Sometimes just me, the camera, and the, and the cast. Anyway, they were going through the scene. I didn't understand what the hell they were saying. Wow. I was just, if somebody was talking, I had the camera on them, you know? Wow. Camera, right? 
of course, you know, in time, you know, I picked up, I can, you know, I can, I can, I can, I can, um, you know, understand a lot more now. But, you know, I, and even the producer, we kept saying that if we want to go beyond Belize, you know, we need to go more English. Yes. You know, more English. Now, my take is, you know, I mean, I understand we want to stay, keep it with the, the, the Creole flavor, the Belize flavor, you know, but even when you talk English and you're Belizean actor, you still have the accent. You know, there's still an accent, you know. It's not like that, what's that guy, um, the, the actor guy, David Oelio, whatever from, from Britain. David Oelio, the guy who played played Martin Luther King and Ava DuVernay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't right. mean, yeah. However, you hear him talking, you know, oh, he's straight from Britain. But then he played, puts on this American accent, you would have no idea. Yeah. Okay? So the thing is, you know, in my opinion, you know, you'd still have that flavor. And so, you know, we'd have all these clashes about, you know, because she would even write the scripts in Creole, <laughs> you know? She would write the scripts in Creole. And sometimes, you know, the cast would even have a hard time with the lines. But that said, um, you know, again, getting outside of Belize, you know, sure, in, in Belize, people understand. But as soon as you try to go to the States, you know, to Europe, somewhere else, you know, people try to, in fact, what I would do with no matter what, when I'm showing it to somebody, I'd watch, I'd look at them. And you can tell they're, they're trying so hard just to understand, you know? It's not like they're just sitting there, you know, enjoying it. You can tell they're, hey, what are they saying? What are they, you know, what, you know? And anyway, so that's a lot of the, 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 the clash and the conflict, you know, they, they came as well. But that said, um, you know, no matter what, uh, we did, again, four seasons, you know, very, very highly. In fact, I was just dubbing uh, something from season one today looking at it. And we, we, did, we, did, we did some good work on, on no matter what. You know, and then again, um, the sitcom, you know, is another, you know, great thing that uh, is coming out of Belize and uh, keeping eye out for it. No, and no, again, no. I do have uh, the pilot and a couple of short pieces I did on my YouTube channel. Again, okay, great. shameless self-promotion, Torb 1958, T-O-R-B 1958, all lowercase, no, spe no, no spaces. Um, and, you know, hopefully... Something will come from it, you know. Something will come from well, it. Let's talk about this. You have, you have Harry, you have with Tyrone, you have um, Myrtle, Arlene, and Vicky. Uh, right. You know, Myrtle's like, um, I, you know, I guess she's like the the mother of the group. The the yeah, Myrtle, Myrtle. The, I'm sorry, Myrtle. Right. Um, and so, how it, how are these characters? How can like when I watched it, I watched some of it. How do they relate to? kids here in the states i mean is there a relationship or are they more belize kids or like how, how they're belize it? kids they're belize kids and, and again that's what you know um you know the creator again kim was the creator and that's what the company wanted they, they wanted more to represent belize in fact uh, one of the scripts the fourth script that they shot was a script that um that i wrote with the friend here uh called tnt where tyrone um ends up falling for uh, Tony, who is uh, the secretary at Harry's insurance office or the insurance office where Harry works, you know, and I mean, they basically went and had to, you know, go through and believe it up because I had, you know, we had references, you know, that, you know, Americans would understand and would get, you know, but Belizeans would have no idea what, what they're talking about. Mm. Okay? So they went in and put a diff bunch of different, you know, phrases and changed a lot of things to make it more Belizean, you know. But that said, you know, in Belize, you take it out of Belize, it goes over everybody else's head, you know? So that was one of the kind of, you know, kind of, um, you know, another conflict, you know, that you have when you're dealing with cultural issues. Again, I understand wanting to preserve, wanting to expose and wanting to present your, your culture, you know, in a positive way, you know, to the world. I understand that, you know, and, you know, I, try to stay as close to it as possible. You know, but I do also understand, you know, and try to push for the getting it to a broader audience, you know, and, yeah. and even subtitles, you know, I did subtitles, you know, to a lot of the no matter what stuff, but people don't like reading subtitles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I watched it and um, not that I hated it, but I, I found myself like trying to say, how can I relate to Harry? You know I mean? How can I relate to the situation, you know? And that was a, a, a constant issue I kept coming back to is like, I don't think I understand these characters and what they're going through. And I don't understand the situation. So uh, maybe, yeah, I think you, you could be right that it's more of, of a Belizean-like scenario. Right, a cultural thing, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and even like um, I, you know, like so. So, what are the issues that they're dealing with? What is it, the main? Because I know, like, it talked about like what is it? Arlene and Vicky are are renting a part of it for uh, you know renting um renting a room. room. Yeah, renting the room, and but you know that was like touched upon, but I didn't get like, is there some financial difficulties? Like, like what is the the, the nexus of all of this? You know, like. <laughs> well, let's see. That is the next system. I mean, yeah, they're just renting. I mean, right now, how to explain all of that that you just asked is not coming to me, you know. <laughs> but I will say again, it is a cultural thing, you know. Like, for instance, um, Tyrone. Tyrone lives in his parents' house, which is like next door in the same yard. Like in Belize, they have like they'll have one big space and have two or three or four houses on that same space. Oh, in that okay. same yard. Okay. You know, I mean, the people will either be relatives, you know, or, you know, they'd be renting out different, you know, parts of it or whatever, you know? So, um, you know, that's one aspect, again, of, of the cultural kind of a thing. Uh, again, you know, Myrtle, who is, you know, Terry's mom, you know, very religious, you know, very loving and overdoting, you know, of Harry. Harry's kind of more the, the uh, you know, kind of the nerdy kind. At least we want to, he started out being nerdy. Okay. But last couple of, he started to come into his own and kind of assert, you know, a little more, you know, more, more power and gravitas, I would say, mm. you know, Tyrone's his good friend, you know, he's the schemer, the scammer, always out to, you know, make, you know, he calls himself an, an entrepreneur. He's always coming up with schemes to make money and everything. And again, Vicky and Arlene, Vicky is an artist. She's an artist, you know, she's renting. And then she actually brings Arlene in, you know, as room oh, financial. Oh problems now that said the pilot which you probably saw uh we lost the vicky and arlene oh we oh you did oh yeah yeah because arlene and vicky some things came up and we had to kind of you know replace them well we actually replaced the vicky vicky's um, very attractive she's a very attractive one <laughs> was, was easy on the eyes she was easy on the eyes. Now, that said um she was hard to work with she didn't take direction very very good oh okay <laughs> It's pulling, you know, pull, no. <laughs> but you know, but yeah, she was easy on the eyes. Uh, actually, she, Arlene is was too, you know. Wow. But anyway, we basically replaced the Vicky. Uh, but we ended up since we couldn't find, we tried to audition for another Arlene and didn't find someone. So I suggested that we bring back Diana. You know, the pilot's title was Dirty Diana. Mm. That Harry um, has this his girlfriend named Diana. That he thinks is a virgin because she's all nice and sweet, you know. And, you know. <laughs> but when they get together, she pulls a fast one on him. She tries uh -huh. to him, you know. And so um, I suggested that we just, you know, kind of rewrite and retweak the scripts to bring Diana back and have Diana take, you know, all of the uh, the 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 um, Arlene lines. Take off, take off all of Arlene lines. So oh, that's what we, yeah. yeah, that's what we did in the last, you know, couple couple episodes. Mm -hmm. Just brought Diane back. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. It, it looks, I mean, um, it, it looks great. So you're doing what are you doing? You're doing camera everything on it, or yeah, lighting, camera, you know, wow. directing, editing. I did, did, did all the all the editing again. Sound. You basically use a wireless microphone. Now I have to put the wireless microphone where we I can put it to hide it to get as close as possible. Right. Um, now we actually shot two camera. You know, we shot with two cameras. Uh, I I had my camera. And a guy named Miles, one of the guys that worked with uh, Denver, he, you know, he shot the other camera. But since the cameras, they were two different cameras, they didn't always match up color-wise. Yeah. So I still had to make sure that I had everything I needed to cut the scene together, you know, on my camera. You know, so it's not like, you know, I can shoot, you know, one over the shoulder, he shoot the old, one other over the shoulder, then we move on, you know, and then, you know, just keep going. I still had to do all of the coverage that I needed to do to make sure I had everything that... I know I needed, you know, on my camera. And then of course, if, you know, he had, you know, different shots and angles that I could use and hit that camera did come in handy a couple of times where I needed to, you know, to, to cover a couple of things, you know? Um, but yeah, it's basically production wise is this me, you know, it's all mm -hmm. me. And again, uh, Denver, you know, he's a great producer. He's a great producer. He basically had everything there, what I needed, when I needed it, you know, he had the food. And like I tell people too, tell my students too, Feed your cast and your crew. A hungry cast and crew will mutiny. It'll get ugly. <laughs> don't want to see Don't want to feed your cast and crew. Okay. If you got to put half your budget into 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 food, do it. 
Mm. Don't let him get hungry. Anyway, Denver is good. And and, and the guys that that uh, were you know he had as his uh his crew, you know his his um employees, they were good. You know as far as you know setting stuff up and making sure everything was there. So so it's an experience. But the thing is, again, you know, it's just so draining you know it's not like okay you, i'm the director i show up everything's lit everything's set we rehearse we block we shoot mm-hmm. i go home no it's not that you know i get there i like you know i set up I mm-hmm. shake, mm-hmm. I, yeah, yeah you know so but again like we talked about earlier you know that's pretty much like i talked to denver about that it seems like you know when i made the decision at ucla to be as well versed in all aspects of you know film production as possible that basically set me up for what we did, you know, for no matter what. Mm. And of course, now for, for living me life. Yeah. You know? Cause I know a lot of people, they, oh, they're a director. Oh, I'm a director. Oh, I've got this script. Oh, and I want to do this script. No, but they can't shoot. They can't light. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, you know yeah. So, so they run around with the script in their back pocket and nothing's happening because they either can't pay or can't find somebody to do the production aspects, you know, for them, you know, for free. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and um, also, again, another thing I used to always tell my students too about being a director or producer and knowing nothing about, you know, the technical aspects because your technical people will run ramshot on you. Yeah. You know, if you don't know, oh no, we need a a five K such and such with a sunscreen and a cycle. Da, 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 da. No, you know, we got to go rent it. It's going to cost two hundred fifty dollars a day. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't need all of that. Yeah, I know. So we wait and we do something, we do it another way. Instead of shooting in the sun, we take it in the shade. You know, you mm-hmm. find a different way to do it. But I have seen, you know, where technical people, you know, the DPs, you know, so will run ramshot over a director or producer that just has no idea what the technical aspects are. Yeah. You know? And, you know, um, speaking of that, too, because I think you and individuals like yourself and myself are very rare because we have, uh, were went to film school, studied on film, and now there's a whole new digital revolution where you have these millennials and they've only worked with digital. They've never actually worked on film. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about Lucky them. (laughs) (laughs) Film, film, film is a headache. (laughs) Don't get me wrong, I miss film. I love film. I believe film is the art of motion picture, you know, cinematic artistry. Because, you know, just like, you know, how painters use paint, they're actually working with the paint and the canvas and they're painting and, you know, and sculptors, they have the clay, they dump in and they got the clay and they're shaping and they're molding it, you know, and film, that's film. You hold the film frame, you look at the film frame, you cut it, you splice it, you're actually creating, you know, your art by touching the actual element of film. In film, 16 millimeter, 35, you're actually using the actual element of film to create your art. I mean, video, digital, I mean, it's all button pushing. It's button pushing. Yeah. Now, that said, it's yeah. quicker, yeah. it's easier. I mean, you can make 10 edits in Final Cut Pro 7, where on the time it takes you to make one edit in film on a flatbed or an yeah. upright moviola. Yeah. You know, but, you know, film is the art. Actually, 16 millimeter is the, is the art. But we used to have... um conversation we'd be, we'd be sitting out you know in front of our edit rooms two three o'clock in the morning ucla debating film you know when video was coming in oh film some people oh film's dead film's gone oh no film is the art film will always be here no i said no as soon as they can get film i mean as soon as they can get video to look as good as film or better than film at a fraction of the price film's gone the way of the stage coach and the dinosaur <laughs> yeah yeah you know and, and and that's pretty much you know what happened yeah. um do you I think, think it equalized too. things though? Do you think it equalized things? Like you put, put independence on the same level as Hollywood now? Cause it's so cheaper and- Yeah, and, yeah, and it can look good. See yeah. another thing too about film. You had to know what the hell you're doing with film. You had to know exposure. You had to know lighting, okay? You had to actually go in and look at the scene, set this light here, give me a 2K zip in the corner, bounce an inky off, of, off the ceiling and you know, give me some backlight. You know, you had to set up and make it look good. It had to look good. You had to look at it with your eyeballs and say, ooh, that looks good. And then you had to set your aperture. You know, you had to write shutter speed and you, know, you had to actually know what you're doing to make that look good. And of course in film too, as you know or remember, you didn't know what the hell you had until yes. it came back from the lab. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. This is before these video assists. Okay, now they have these video assists. And, you know, the director standing looking at the little video screen, you know. No, the director had no idea what the hell the cinematographer was seeing 
okay, until it got back from the lab. But that said, um, it had to look good. Today, you know, with digital, I mean, you can just go on whatever your natural light. If you got some decent natural lighting, you oh. can set that camera up, crank up the ISO, and it looks decent, if yeah. not pretty good, you yeah. know? So that said, I mean, it's like it's one thing, it's like a double-edged sword, I used to call it, you know, in, in class. Because, again, before the students had to know what they were doing to make it look good. Now it's the technology that makes it look, you know, so much better. So even though it looks good, what the hell did you have to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> Other than yeah. turning on the camera, you know? Anyway, so so that's that's all a part of that. Yeah. And again, another thing too, like with the technology, you know, I mean, anybody and everybody can make a film now. They can use their iPhones and go and make a film and do what the heck they, they're gonna do, you know? Whereas again, before you had half film, you had to buy the film. Film cost between 50 and $200 a roll, 400 foot, you know? You had to, if you didn't have a camera, you had to rent, you know, a film camera, you know? Hold on one, you there? Okay, hold on one second. I think we uh, lost Professor Barry. Give me one second. Okay, hold on one second. I think it's an internet connection issue. Let me just text him real quick. Let's give him a moment to see if he comes back on. So we were talking with Professor Barry about the difference between digital and straight shooting on film in traditional days of 16 to 35 millimeter and, uh, and even what 70 millimeter as well. So let me see if he's going to come back on. Uh, that was actually a, an awesome interview, um, getting some good insight as to what it takes to be a jack of all trades. Okay, hold on one second. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. All right, he's going to be signing back on really soon. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Bear with us. This is what happens when you uh, do live broadcasts. You don't know what can happen. Um, it's live, so all kinds of uh, things can occur. Still waiting for him. Oh, he's trying to reboot his computer, so give us a minute. Anyway, while we're waiting, I just want to say I saw the uh, new Planet of the Apes movie, and uh, I posted my review, and I wasn't too impressed with it. I was actually kind of disappointed in the film. I thought it was trying to uh, milk the audience for emotions, and. Uh, I don't think it, it really set up for um, the original series. I was looking for more of a setup to lead into that. And it, to me, I felt it didn't do that, although it had some of the, the characters name from the original series, but that was as much as we got as a lead into it. Um, so, and overall, I've been kind of disappointed with Hollywood movies in general, because I think that Basically, it's all about setting up a franchise or setting up this, this universe. They want to do Godzilla versus King Kong. They want to do all of this stuff. But they're not focusing on making one good movie. They're trying to make, you know, all of this stuff. I think the Tom Cruise movie, The Mummy, was trying to set up this, this universe with the, the Invisible Man, um, Frankenstein, and all that. And I just, I just thought they needed to just focus on making one good movie and then uh, lead into all of that other stuff. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm in this broadcast, and then we're going to pick up with a part two. Um, hey, and, hey, you there? Sorry, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> broadcast. Glad you're back. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Modern technology. Yeah, you're but, live, so anything can happen. We're live. Yeah, but we couldn't do this with film, right? <laughs> no, we could. <laughs> now you were saying that on that that note, you're talking about the difference between film and digital. You're you're. Uh, speaking about that and how you know you don't have to be knowledgeable uh, about how the light is set and all that with digital that the technology makes the picture look good. Yes, 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 yes. But again, I think that's why they, like they talk about the red camera and the black magic camera. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They say, oh, but it's more like film. It's more like film. I think that that's it. Because with those cameras, if you got an ugly set, it's ugly. You know, if you got ugly lighting, it's ugly. You really have to make it look good in order for that to, you know, represent, you know, what it is you're looking. But a lot of this other digital and these, these, uh, these, these, um, 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 DSLR cameras, you crank up the ISO, boy, and that stuff looks good. Yeah, yeah. You know, it used to be, it's funny because I noticed that something changed, right? And I think this is in like 2000, 2001, and you know, I'm saying how old I am, but I remember when I used to say I'm a filmmaker and everybody was like, wow. And I started saying, you know, I'll go in these network parties and say I'm a filmmaker and no one was impressed. So I was no. like, what's going on? <laughs> everybody can do it now. Everybody yeah. can do it now. You know the the access to the technology you know just is not what it what it used to be yeah, yeah. well you know what i want to pick your brain on something mm -hmm. um we've got about like five minutes left but i really want oh, to know because oh, i got something else i really need to talk about sure sure let okay. me, let me one, one of the, the 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 recent most recent crucial projects i've been working on is a, a documentary film called the cooney the, the cooney the cusini concept the pride and sabotage Oh yeah, it's not with uh Kelly Berry, is that well Kelly Marie Berry? She was one of the deltas that I, I interviewed. Oh, okay. But that's it. Okay. Back in 19 the 1970s during the black exploitation era, Delta Sigma Theta sorority financed a motion picture called Countdown and Cusini. Okay. Their concept was uh they had a controlled market distribution plan. Okay. They had, let's say at the time they had, let's say they had 100,000 members. If they could rely on all 100,000 of the members to support the film and say, you know, $10 a member, that would give them X amount of dollars. If they could make the film for that amount or below, then when the film came out and they came and bought those tickets and they brought their husbands and family and friends and children and neighbors and coworkers about, they're guaranteed a profit, right? Right, yeah. Okay, made sense to me when I first heard it, my first year at UCLA. Okay, I said, dang, that's brilliant. They lost their money. It didn't work. They lost their money for years, for years, for years. I'm like, how did that not work? And then uh, when I did uh, my my first book, uh, the 50 most influential black films. Yes, I remember that book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I made sure that you know I wrote up you know Countdown to Cusini. All right. In talking to um, Ossie Davis, who was the producer director, and also Dr. Gene Noble, who was a Delta, who was a uh, you know, one of the main deltas in, in fun. I found out that they were dis they were were sabotaged by the distributor. <gasps> oh yeah. <laughs> Columbia Pictures, okay. Columbia Pictures, who was a distributor, did not coordinate the release of the film with the chapters. Okay. So therefore they would release the film in a city, not let the deltas know. It's sitting in the theaters, don't nobody know about it. When it's there a day or two, the theater owners kick it out. All right. So they did not give the deltas enough time, you know, to get the theater's full and it's okay, on such and such a date, we're gonna open it in this theater. Your chapter needs to be ready. And then we're gonna open in this theater. You know, the chapters need to be ready in this city, this city, this city. The Delta's gonna make a whole lot of money, okay? But instead, it's, it's like, there's a sense that they failed and they're embarrassed and all this and that and other thing. Well, my content is that, you know, that controlled market distribution, you know, can work today. Yes. Okay? And they can make even more money off of it. They're having, in fact, right now, deltas, thousands, tens of thousands of deltas are in Las Vegas during their national convention. So tell me, why is my documentary not playing for their convention? <laughs> it's because they have not responded to me ever. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They have not responded. It's like they don't even give a hoot. They don't care. Now, a couple of individual chapters, the uh, Detroit chapter where Lillian Bimbo, who's the president who spearheaded the film thing, they actually had a 40th anniversary uh, filmmaker, uh, 40th anniversary sc screening last year, April 16th. And um, I had a couple screenings out in LA at the, uh, 
at the Mamie Clayton Museum, you know. Um, and the graduate chapter in Atlanta sponsored a screening. But as far as the national organization, they haven't even responded. They haven't even responded. In fact, they even shut down. They did to me what, what Columbia did to them 40 years ago. Uh, the, I know I went to school at Arizona State with the president of the uh, alumni chapter in City, Century City in LA, and they were going to do a screening for me. And when the national found out, they called and shut it down. Said, wow. oh, we don't know if this film shows Delta Sigma Theta in a positive light, you know? Oh, oh. So, so I mean, that, that was crushing, you know, because I said, damn, you know, 40 years later, they're going to do me like, you know, they were done. Yeah, yeah. But then I at least said, well, at least now I'm on the radar, you know, because before just not getting any response, at least they know I'm here. Right. Well, two years ago, they still haven't responded. So that's a very, very, very um, hurtful um, effort that I've been into for the last, you know, four or five years. You know, wow. that they have not responded because, uh, again, they can make their money back plus today. They can do it, you know. So but again, they don't seem like they're interested. Um, also need to mention about Hellbound Train. Those of you who are interested, um, Kina Lorber, Kino Lorber, they uh, released a uh, series called um, Pioneers of African-American Cinema. And one of the films in it, or actually three of the films, are, are James and Eloise Gist. They were this evangelistic team back in the 1920s, late 1920s. They had a film called Hellbound Train that I was instrumental in um, restructuring. Uh, the film was discovered or rediscovered in a vault at the Library of Congress. You know, they, the films were old and brittle. They had fallen apart and I actually put it back together and uh, did the uh, edit decision list that they used. Uh, so uh, it's also, I just saw on the email that it's available now on Netflix. Okay. Great. So interesting. I mean, they've got some old Michaud films. Um, they've got, I think the, uh, the, 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 oh, what's the writer's name that did ethnographic films? Um, da, 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 da. Well, I think of it when I'm not trying to think of it. Anyway, mm -hmm. they've got a lot of old, you know, um, films. Some, some of the um, Spencer Williams films are on it. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of old films, very old films, uh, pioneer films that that are on there. And I was uh, again very uh, instrumental in making you know Hellbound Train happen for them, which is great because I've been pushing Hellbound Train for 10, 12 years or so. You okay. know, before they yeah, came. I've along. heard of that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You know. Yeah. All right. So, what did you want to pick? Oh, my I did game two. of cards, though. I did like that. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea of the the, the older uh, the older wise man imparting his wisdom to the younger guy that was really good. Yeah. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about was I, I just wanted to get your take on what you thought about this Hollywood so white and what do you think about this new crop of directors and where where is things going as far as African American um, filmmakers are concerned? Where do you think things are going? Well, I mean, I think it's better than it was. I mean, it's, it's better than it was, you know, I can say that. And I will say that now, like most of the time you go to movies, you know, you see, you know, African-American representation, you see, you know, Hispanic representation, you definitely see a lot of, you know, gay representation nowadays. You know? <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a good thing, you know, in, in, in a lot of places. Um, I don't know a whole lot about you know, a lot of the, you know, Ryan Coogler, and of course there's a, a, a Ava DuVernay's, you know, yeah. really kicking uh -huh. a lot Ava DuVernay, yeah. I mean, these are the, the hot flavors of the month, and hopefully, you know, they will be continuing, you know, to go on and move and go. Uh, I don't think that, um, you know, race is necessarily as much of an issue as it was. Yeah. But we may, that may have also been coming from the eight years of Obama, okay? Now that we got, you know, the man in there now who is turning back the clock, he's going to make America great again. He's turning back the clock, you know, constantly consistent. I just heard Sessions today talking about he's going to make it diff more difficult for people to sue um, companies for racial discrimination and everything. They're turning back the clock, you know. So, you know, hey, if they got their, their hand on the rail. They better hold on to it because, you know, anytime soon. It, 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 it may be gone. It may be gone. But, you know, hopefully, you know, I think I think that we've done, we, you know, we've come a long way, as they say, you know, and it's still not perfect. I said I still do not believe there's anyone of color at any of the major studios that can green light a motion picture. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I still no. don't think that's the case. But that said, um, you know, now with Netflix and HBO and all these other, you know, outlets making movies and doing television shows and series, you know, the studios are not that 
as powerful as they as they once were. Right. Yeah. yeah that's right. And again, getting back to Cusini, I think that was it. The Deltas, if the Deltas had made a profit in 1976, you know, that would have opened up a whole new floodgate for any organization with tens of thousands of dedicated members might have abandoned their bake sales and church church, you know, events and car washes and started making movies, you know, as a fundraising event. Hollywood, the studios would have lost their power. I think that's why they, you know, torpedoed them the way they did. Uh, but anyway, that said, you know, now we've got cable. You know, there's a lot more outlets. And again, I think there are a lot more, um, you know, people with the ease and the technology of production now, you know, that are actually out there making movies. So um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what visions, you know, come from here, you know, come from here. Because there are still so many visions that have not been told, so many of our stories that have not been told, yeah. you know. And yeah, I I'll tell I'll, anybody, the technology, was, thing, if it's in your head, you can get it out there. Yeah, on that yeah, same thing, I've always said that because, you know, they're always complaining about how um, um, Hollywood keeps doing, doing the kitchen movie 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 and they don't hire African American actors, actors. right? Right. Yeah. Well, I yeah. said, you know, the, Christ, the, the, the black churches could get together and pull their money together and shoot their own Jesus of Nazareth or Noah or, or, or whatever, you know, a Moses film, and they have a built-in distribution market. Oh, yeah, uh, again, the audience. controlled market, the controlled market distribution system. Yeah, you know, national, uh, the 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 what is it? The National Baptist Convention. You know, they can make a movie and have all of their churches and members sell tickets and have money. You know, it can be done. Yeah. You know, but again, but where is the catalyst? Who is that person, or what's the catalyst that's going to inspire and motivate them? You know, to come together to make that happen. Mm. You know, so who's so, your who's your like who do you look up today? What director or producer do you really admire today? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I look in the mirror every morning. No, no, just kidding, just kidding. Um, no, really, there's no there's no one I can I can say. Now that said, let me let me back up a bit. Um, Avatar, James Cameron. I used to think Spielberg was a bad boy. Okay, James Cameron is kicking it. Yeah, he is. Cameron is phenomenal. Now that said, um, I think F. Gary Gray is doing some phenomenal stuff. F. Gary Gray, um, the one, the one that's married to Leela Roshan, what's his name? Roshan. Did a uh, Training Day. Oh, I know you're talking about. Oh, I forgot his name. I forgot his name. Yeah, he's yeah, name. he's doing some phenomenal work, and he's out there kicking butt. Like I said, Ava DuVernay. You know, she's you know been put on you know, you know this pedestal and is now doing some some phenomenal work and reaching out and doing some things. You know. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very, very promising, again, unless, you know, the clock gets turned back and attitudes, you know, get, get retrenched, you know, and uh, we, we go back to the good old days of antebellum South <laughs> before Obama, you know? So that was, uh, I just looked it up, it's Anton Fuqua. Yes, Anton Fuqua, yes, yes, he's, he's really, done yeah, He's a good director, he's, he's, Man, um, when he did that, that the the knights in shiny armor movie, yeah, that was uh, was that yeah. King, uh, King Arthur? I think yeah, it King was. Arthur. Oh, I was so impressed. I said, "Get down, brother!" Yeah, yeah. Arthur, shit. I mean, they should. I'm waiting to see him on Game of Thrones. Okay. Oh I'm yeah, you know what? That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm waiting for them to bring Antoine over for Game of Thrones. But I think he's, he's doing like Pablo Escobar movie or something. To yeah, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. But you know. He could do some Game of Thrones, okay? Yeah, he, that's that's hot right now. We'll, we'll, you know, I think that um, he's not getting the credit he deserves, but he just needs the right project. You know what I mean? I'd say so. Yeah, yeah but there are some folks uh, doing some good things. Doing some good things. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to talk to me. And All right. You have a lot of wisdom and knowledge, man. Thank you. I appreciate. Hey, last, it. last couple things, real quick. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Self promotion again, along with film. Okay. I realize film costs money. You need money. You need equipment. You need cash. You need crew. You need a whole lot of people to tell your story. Okay. Writing, you don't. This. Cry Tough, actually called Tears Now. Cry Tough. This is my first novel. Okay, I read my first novel. It deals with racism, oh. how racism is uh, indoctrinated into children in America. Uh, I just did a new version. This version is actually like a mirror. It actually tells the story of a little white boy and a little black boy, and kind of what racism does to both of them. My newest version, I cut out the white folks. So it's all <laughs> about all about us. It's all about us because I couldn't get any traction with this one. So now that's a new version. And then I also have the Honey Man's Son. 
Honey Man's Son is a uh, coming of age piece takes place in America, uh, late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, at the time when the WPA came through and put in um, 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 indoor plumbing. You know what Honey Man was? No, no. Right. Well, back in the good old days, before they had indoor toilets, they had outhouses. Okay. Got well, it. the Honey Man would come around in the honey wagon and empty out the honey pots. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what honey is, right? Yeah. yeah. You know how to be shit, right? You yeah. know how to be shit. So they call human honey, you know. Be shit. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's basically about a young boy. Uh, he worked with his father since he was seven, you know, when that day came. He was ostracized by his friends. And now he's 17, about to graduate from high school. His father wants to, you know, leave the business to him, wants him to take over the business. Like he took over from his father. But he wants to go to Hollywood and become an actor and become a star. So mm. that's a little, little, little conflict. And he hops a freight train and goes on this adventure. So that's uh that's Honey Man's son. Anyway, uh they are all available. Anybody interested, you know, hook me up. Amazon or uh no, just come through me. Well, actually, they are on well, Tears is on Amazon um Prime, where you can actually order them or whatever down on the what you call it book. Other than just you know, reach out to me, sberry at howard.edu. Awesome. Sberry awesome. at howard.edu. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I, didn't I, didn't book. I knew you wrote, I wrote the romance novel, the romance book. Oh, yeah. Girl. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I actually yeah. co-wrote that and published it and lost my shirt, but <laughs> that was a timing thing. That was a timing thing. Yeah, it was, because after that, they had an explosion of black yeah. romance yeah, novels. It was called Love Forsaken. Yeah. We were one of the first, but the bigger boys came in and kind of overshadowed us. You know, it was, yeah. a, it was, it was yeah. a timing thing on that. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. So we'll make sure to put the, in the description box links to how you can contact Barry and get his books and everything. And thank you for, um, again, taking the time to talk to us and imparting your wisdom and knowledge. So what are you off to <laughs> do now? To call it, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> um, well, hey, well, good talk to you again, man. And hey, it was it was a great experience working with you uh, on Bugged. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure my students, you know, because I always brought students up to work with you. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, um, hopefully uh, they still remember that experience. But um, good work to you. And congrats on what you're doing today, man, all this podcast and keeping the word going, getting the word out, man. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate right. it. Sure Bye -bye. thing, dude. So yeah. I thank you for tuning in. This is Ron Armstrong, filmmaker extraordinaire. Until my next broadcast, that's all for now. <laughs>